Thank you, Scott, uh, for the warm introduction. And uh, it is great to see some friends and folks from uh, Michigan uh, that are here. Uh, but I, I count all of you as friends because this is an industry that I certainly uh, enjoy working in. And uh, we'll look forward to, to working with you. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, say a few words uh, about some of the work that's being done uh, in Congress and in the Senate. Uh, I'm, ver I'm very passionate about this uh, industry. I just think you know, we're, we're on the cusp here of just transforming mobility in this country in ways that certainly the, the public uh, doesn't fully understand what's coming at them. Uh, when I talk about some of the things that are happening, people are kind of like those wow kind of moments. Uh, I had a chance uh, to, uh, I guess it was about a, about a year and a half ago uh, now, ride in the uh, Google car when I was out in California and uh, go down the highway. And you're, many of you are all familiar with that. But that's a little freaky to be in a car that's just driving itself uh, down down the road. Uh, and we had a car come over into our lane and uh, it adjusted uh, quite well to that and then took us uh, down the uh, uh, the exit ramp. And then, then the driver took over at that point as we were in the in the city streets. Uh, but it's pretty it's fairly remarkable. And uh, I just had an opportunity, uh, uh, I guess, about two or three weeks ago to one of our auto suppliers uh, in Michigan along Updike Road there. Uh, who uh, took me in uh, in their cars uh, doing the driver assist? We were out on the out on the road. We were out on Updike Road, which is uh, actually near where I where I live. Uh, and as we traveled, he, he put on the driver assist in addition to the cruise control and just drove right on down uh, Updike, a, a road that I drive a lot to actually driving. But to have the car driving itself, we were following another vehicle. It came to a stoplight. It stopped uh, uh, at the red light. Uh, my understanding uh, is that it also stops at yellow lights, which is different than my driving behavior. But uh, I always thought that meant go faster when you get to a yellow light. But uh, this car stops as soon as it sees the yellow or the red. Did it very smoothly. Uh, my understanding uh, is that General Motors, I think, is going to have that uh, in production, my understanding, in the next was the next model year and some top end Cadillacs, uh, which is uh, that's and I when I just talk to people about that driving down Updike with a car driving itself, it's certainly one of those wow, really? And it's like, yeah, next year General Motors will be offering that. And I'm sure other automakers here will be will be uh, right along in that same kind of uh, timeline as well. The uh, The other demonstration we had that I thought was uh, was wonderful, and I talk about a lot when I'm out on the uh, the stump too, is that uh, this is the, the actual vehicle to vehicle communication when the cars were talking to each other as we were going down the road and we had connected cars. And we, uh, they simulated uh, what is the very frequent accident as you're following a car and you're probably following it maybe a little too close uh, and it's going fairly quick. And all of a sudden it veers out of the way and right in front of you is now a car going very slow and it's the leading cause for rear ends and, uh, and an accident going in. So uh, we were driving down the road and the car sw uh, swerved away, but our car had already been talking to the car ahead two cars ahead saying, hey, I'm slowing down or I'm a, I'm a hazard here. And, and the car automatically uh, was in the braking mode as well. So I mean, it's, it's uh, incredible stuff that, uh, that all of you are working on. I know in some capacity and are trying to figure out ways in which we make that happen. Uh, and uh, from a safety standpoint, uh, to talk uh, to be, and these are statistics you know very well, but uh, to think that within just a few years, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Board, that we can eliminate 80% of all crashes uh, in uh, on the highways uh, is really a, a big deal. And uh, those of you who are on the forefront of that, thank you for doing that. Uh, I can thank you as the father of teenage girls uh, who are driving. Uh, that's really, a, really a big deal. Uh, uh, our sons too. I don't have my son is through that now, but you know this is uh, this is incredible uh, technology that that you're involved with. We have to now make sure that the policy is going to to be there to continue to move it forward. I think uh, this also helps us in addition to the safety factors. Scott mentioned the transportation bill too. I mean, we always have challenges with infrastructure and finding the money. Well, it was great we have a three-year bill going forward with some funding to do that, but it's going to continue to be a challenge to have the infrastructure investments coming out of out of here. Uh, and building new roads and expanding that as populations increases. But but this is part of the solution. This is really these kind of technologies as well, is that we're going to be able to put a lot more cars on uh, a lot less, on, on more constrained places uh, and do it safely. You can follow closer to people and put more, move traffic through in coordination with lights and everything else. It, uh, it helps us use technology to deal with the infrastructure problems as we're continually grappling to try to get more money and, and uh, funding for it. But I also know that uh, we have to deal with uh, the policy issues. We had it recently dealing with the uh, the uh, 5.9 gigahertz, and you're well aware of all that battle. I think you've been talking about that uh, earlier today. I think we're in a good good spot. I'd love to hear from you in the Q&A as to where we are, that we at least we're researching it to make sure that we can share it. 
I was certainly very concerned uh, when there were folks here that wanted to uh, basically take it away from the auto industry when we were just on the cusp of really seeing some dramatic changes in, in how these systems are going to work. Uh, hopefully, we're going to be able to figure out how to share that, make sure everybody's able to use it. But I wanna, I'm going to be watching that extremely closely, and we look forward to working uh, with folks here in this room and others uh, to make sure, though, that we don't lose the ability to, to implement these incredible, particularly safety technologies in vehicle to vehicle. And uh, so we don't have the answer yet, but I think we're on the right path, hopefully, uh, getting us uh, to where we have uh, to go. But I think there, uh, and this this group is uh, primarily about the technology and moving it forward and, and the, the excitement of that, but it raises issues that we have to grapple with as well. And, and uh, that means uh, insurance, for example. Uh, I think about that as how, how is the insurance industry going to, to adapt to this? What, what sort of things do we need to be doing in Congress related to that? Especially if you're on an autonomous vehicle and you hit another car, who's, who's liable for that? Is it the... the the company that built the uh, self-driving car, is it the driver who didn't react and take the steering wheel? Same with the, the uh, driver assist. You know, where are some of those liability issues associated uh, with that? Uh, we have a great facility in, in Michigan, which I'll mention briefly, which Dr. Swetman is a uh, part of. Uh, uh, and uh, when we were at the grand opening, uh, we had all of the signs of all the companies that have brought everybody together, which is exciting. It's auto companies, it's telecommunications companies, it's the insurance industry as well, everybody coming together to think this through. Uh, but those are significant issues uh, that we have to be developing as hopefully as quickly as the technology is developing, although the technology is advancing very, very rapidly. So we've got to be thinking about, you know, how are we going to be moving that uh, going forward? The other area, and it's related to the other another committee that I serve on in addition to commerce, and that's Homeland Security. Of course, uh, cyber issues are uh, first and foremost on this, cybersecurity, which is a big issue for, for everybody, every single industry, the financial industry as well. But it is particularly important uh, for for vehicles, uh, vehicle to vehicle technology and autonomous vehicles, uh, if we have that. Uh, the uh, everybody's uh, nightmare scenarios having a kid in a t-shirt sitting in the basement driving your car while you're you know in it uh, going down the road <laughs> you know can hack into your system and uh, uh, that's an extreme example obviously but those are the kinds of things that we've got to be uh, very vigilant and figure out ways uh, to deal with it we we passed cyber legislation uh, out of the Senate uh, to deal with that in a sharing arrangement to allow companies to come together and have some liability protection if they're sharing information so that when we're being attacked, when you're being attacked, your company's being attacked, you, you know that uh, you can share that, particularly with the government officials, and, and have some security when it comes to the legal liability as to what may occur if there's some personal information, which hopefully isn't shared, but still may uh, go. Uh, we've got to figure out ways to work more uh, cooperatively, too, and bring in government agencies working closely with industry. And that means Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, understanding each other's protocols. You understand uh, the government's protocols and back and forth in order for us to work cooperatively. And I think we've got a really a long way uh, to go uh, in that area. In fact, I just had a meeting a couple weeks ago with folks in the payments industry, uh, mobile payments and payments, particularly down in Atlanta, where there's this major center of every transaction we have. And of course, cars will be doing that soon, too. We've got mobile payments with automobiles that'll you'll drive up to a fast food place and already have your order and payment. And as you move through, uh, but the security of that is going to be critical. And they thought that one of the most important aspects for them uh, was having a closer relationship with the Department of Defense and Homeland Security and, and figuring out how we, we do this thing together. None of us can do this by ourselves. Uh, we've got to come together in order to do it uh, in, a, uh, in a cooperative uh, way. The other issue I'm, uh, I'm working on uh, is uh, related to my science uh, committee and space uh, committee. And I'll just touch on it briefly, but that's space weather, which certainly impacts the telecommunications industry in a big way uh, and just our whole society. And I think we are not fully prepared uh, for what could be some extreme solar events uh, that could, uh, could occur. Or I shouldn't say could, they, they will occur. An extreme solar event that will occur is just a question uh, of time. And when you think back of the Kerrigan event back in the 1850s, the last major solar storm of uh, consequence uh, that uh, at that time knocked out all the telegraph systems in the country. That was the only electricity we really had back then. Some of them even burned up and uh, completely shut it down. If you had that kind of solar flare hit us uh, today, there was a recent report from Lloyd's of London that just came out a while ago that said that kind of storm, given the systems we have in place now, could potentially do up to $3 trillion worth of damage. That's with a T. That's even a big number in Washington, you know, $3 trillion, $3 trillion uh, 
uh, is huge. And the frightening thing about that with some of these transformers is those areas that are knocked out uh, could be uh, out of power for a year or two. Just think of New York City without power for a year or two. A pretty frightening uh, prospect. And so uh, we uh, need to do more in that area. I'm going to be working with my committee and NASA and having more satellites that can uh, monitor uh, the uh, sun and uh, give us advance warning, but as well as protocols of the utility industry, how we shut this stuff down, how we protect all these uh, systems, including your vehicle to vehicle uh, uh, information. The University of Michigan, I'm gonna, I'm proud to say, I'm great, we have a great U of M person here, but the University of Michigan is actually one of the leaders in heliophysics uh, too. So it just so happens that uh, we're really very well positioned uh, to deal uh, with that issue. And then I just wanna bring up another policy issue too that we don't think about a lot, but I think as policymakers we have to think more of, and that's how uh, technology and this rapid rate of uh, change that we see, how that's going to impact our society in ways of jobs and job creation, and perhaps in different ways than has been in the past. You know, the, the uh, paradigm has always been technology certainly destroys jobs, we know that, but it always creates more jobs uh, in the process. It's just about shuffling that deck, and in the long run, we actually expand. There are some folks and some evidence that says maybe that's not necessarily the paradigm going forward, not to look like a Luddite uh, or others from the past who are always concerned about that. We actually may be at that inflection point where technology is rapid, it's so rapidly expanding, we will see job creation uh, not keep up, particularly with middle class jobs and, and necessary to have a strong economy, you've got to have good, solid uh, middle class. And when you think about the fact that the uh, number one occupation for males in America is driving, in, of, uh, in some aspect of driving, whether you're a chauffeur, a taxi, Uber, a truck driver, I was with Central Transport uh, in Michigan and some of the work they're doing with the University of Michigan as well to have self-driving trucks. Uh, that displaces uh, a lot of folks. Uh, think of Uber, and I, use this, I love using this example too. You know, when you put in your Uber, you put in your address and the car shows up and you get in. Just imagine if you're getting in and there's not a driver in the car. You just call Uber and it uh, shows up at your doorstep, you get in and it takes you to wherever you're gonna go. That's a lot of jobs that aren't there anymore. So those are, uh, those are broader issues than just transportation, but certainly things as policymakers we have to think, particularly as we've seen a shrinking middle class and, and changes in our society over these, that have been evolving over these last two or three decades, and that may accelerate over the next uh, two or three decades. I think it would, be, um, uh, it would be wrong for us not to be thinking about some of those issues as well. So I'm going to leave it. I think you wanted to have some give and take, uh, but I thank you for this uh, opportunity to be here. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, I will uh, be your champion. Uh, it's great to see all these industry groups, academia, everybody coming together. And you're just on the, on the cusp of what's going to be transformational. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for coming and spending your time here. Um, Mark Fields, um, CEO of Ford, about two weeks ago announced that Ford would have automated driving on expressways in 2019. Um, one of the policy issues that I'm not sure how it's our DOT could handle is how do I drive in an automated vehicle at highway speed? I would not like to be in a car doing 55 miles an hour on I-75 or I-94. Um, has there been any consideration um, from your committees about addressing how we allow automated vehicles to behave properly within the driving environment instead of having to follow um, specific um, speed limits? Instead of uh, speed limits? You mean, yes. So what are you, what are you, what are you saying with that? Uh, well, that if I take um, Detroit area traffic, very rarely is it driving at speed limit. Oh, well, yeah, 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 that's true. Uh, so if I have an automated vehicle, and it drives at the speed limit, it's probably a menace it because be. everybody's trying to cut around it. Um, so there needs to be some way to allow us who are doing automated vehicles to be able to drive at the same speed that the other cars are driving instead of being restricted to a slow speed that um, could cause problems. Well, uh, I, and that raised, that's a great issue, uh, and it raises the issue kind of building from the one that I mentioned briefly in my comments, too, with insurance is who's liable for this, and these are the rules, the rules of the road, uh, broadly speaking, which we haven't really addressed, that we have to as policymakers to think that through, or it's going to ultimately it'll stifle all the great work that folks in this room are doing in the fact that you can't actually use these 
vehicles and this technology because uh, the rules of the road aren't there. So, uh, you know, that raises an issue that you have to be safe, so you have to go with the flow of traffic. And if the flow of traffic is uh, greater than you are, uh, but then that leads the question, uh, because broader too, if your vehicle is making uh, those kinds of decisions, however the matrix is to do that, uh, and then that you get pulled over by the police for speeding. Uh, who gets the ticket? Uh, your your car is not going to pay that ticket probably. So, uh, you know, who is it? The person who allowed that to occur? You have to monitor it as an individual. Uh, uh, th those are the kinds of things that we'll have to uh, to uh, address uh, because it's a completely new area, obviously, for us. So that's a good point. Thank you. For transportation, yeah, it's uh, well. We uh, three years is long term in uh, in the uh, U.S. Congress right now, so that's pretty long. But it, we have to uh, we have to find out ways to to generate the revenue. We we did a lot of pay fors, and a lot of the pay fors that came into this, uh, none of us were, were particularly happy with. You know, it's a heck of a way to fund transportation. You need to have, in my mind at least, a, a direct link to the transportation, which is why the fuel tax obviously. Uh, is uh, an important part. The more you drive, uh, the more you pay as a user type of fee system. But we also know that the, uh, the that is really antiquated in many respects because uh, cars are getting a lot more fuel efficient uh, than they were. So even though you're you're paying that, it's not the same rate because of the fuel efficiency. And if we get to electric vehicles and other types of propulsion systems that become more widespread, then those folks aren't paying it. Uh, so, uh, you know, eventually, uh, this is my thinking, you probably have to go to a vehicle miles driven kind of uh, process to make it a user fee. But I'll say that's a difficult lift. I mean, although the people in my in my caucus, in the Democratic caucus, I think are, are open to that kind of uh, structure to make sure that we have revenue that can continue to, to do the work that we're doing uh, in infrastructure. Uh, that it's uh, right now difficult from a political standpoint for the other side, which is just so they don't want any tax increases, they don't want to generate any revenue, but I don't know how you fix uh, and, and improve the infrastructure. You mentioned in your, uh, in your comments uh, the uh, legislation that I authored uh, vehicle to infrastructure, which is part of this transportation bill, uh, which I'm very excited about. Uh, and the public loves it too. It's another one of my examples. You know, I, I'll say, imagine if a bridge is freezing over and it tells your car it's freezing over to slow down. I mean, that it'll stop accidents before they ever occur. But there's a cost associated with that. We got to get the sensors in the road uh, in order to connect uh, with your vehicle. And that's going to take a, a larger funding source long term to transform the infrastructure throughout the country, not just filling the potholes and fixing the bridges, but being able to, to put the sensors and the electronics in our road systems where the technology is. Um, uh, that's still a pretty heavy lift. We've got to get the industry together. We got to get the public together to understand we cannot be a world class economy if we don't have world class infrastructure. And you got to pay for it. It's not free. And the longer you wait to pay for it, it ends up going up in price. It's more and more expensive. But uh, it's still a tough, tough thing to do politically right now. And uh, but hopefully in the next two or three years, we can start laying some of that foundation. Uh, Senator, just following on from your comments that you just made, so the the uh, availability, the ability, the funding to put this. Uh, wireless communication in the infrastructure is obviously critical. So do you see that as something that's going to happen in particular areas? You know, we've got a, uh, the certain cities are going to want to deploy this, certain corridors are going to make those kind of investments. Um, and also, is there any potential, um, if it's inevitable that some of the spectrum is going to be auctioned off, that's going to raise a lot of cash. So is it possible that some of that can be turned back to get this all important infrastructure uh, built out. I think that's a, a, a potentially a source. I think that's a great idea too, especially if it's related to infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure necessary to have the wireless uh, in place, that that may be very well be a, a good place uh, to take uh, a look at it. The first part of your question as far as the locales, the, uh, the legislation is such that it allows you to use federal money as it's coming in to do that. It doesn't mandate it, doesn't require it. It's up to local uh, governments to make those decisions. We wanted to give that tool for us in Michigan, for example, where we're going to do a lot with, uh, and I, you, you've probably already addressed the group. They, they're aware of the thousands of cars we're going to put on the road uh, through the University of Michigan, uh, but having the ability as we're, we're doing that to be able to connect those uh, uh, or put it in the highways, you needed the flexibility within the federal funding because it wasn't allowed to do. Now you're allowed to do it. But you'll see certain municipals, municipalities will take up that take up that challenge or take up that uh, that area at, at different uh, rates. 
Uh, we're probably not to the point where it's a critical mass yet. Now it's going to be select areas like the greater Detroit area that'll do it. There'll be other places around the country as well. Uh, but then you would scale it up uh, all over the country, particularly when people see the results of this. And I'm so confident uh, that you know we're, when, when the general public sees what can happen here and, and how their way of thinking of mobility will be transformed, uh, it'll, you'll, you'll see it qu pretty quickly adopted, but we have to make sure you have the flexibility to access federal money to do that. And that is in the bill now, which is great. And I think it'll stay there. And now we got to figure out how to expand it and fund it. Certainly, sale of spectrum is a great idea. Uh, this is a question from the live streaming. Uh, what is Congress's path forward on addressing cybersecurity? What, what is Congress's path on uh, adjusting uh, cyber? Well, the, the first path was the information uh, sharing uh, that uh, did, did pass. And so that uh, is where, where we are right now. Uh, we have to then uh, now take it to the, the next level. We're getting more information as to about how that should go. So we want to hear from folks in industry here as the steps uh, that are being made. You know, part of the debate uh, in Congress is to what extent do we do we mandate uh, things with cyber and to what extent do you make it permissive and set some kind of standards that that industry picks. Uh, and a lot of folks uh, are, don't really like the having the mandates, particularly as technology changes uh, so rapidly. On the other hand, my concern is, uh, as all of you are aware, the, uh, when it comes to cyber, uh, it's the weakest link in the chain. You could be doing a great job in your company on cybersecurity, but wherever that chain is, whatever the weakest link is, is a way to get in to you. We saw that in a breach that occurred uh, with uh, one of the large retailers, and it was through one of their, I think it was an air conditioning contractor, through a major retailer that was able to breach data and steal an awful lot of uh, information uh, from customers. So there was a case where it was the weakest link, which you wouldn't think. So if you let everybody just do it voluntarily, you're going to have some companies that will do it and there'll be leaders in it, but they're still going to be linked to some weakest link somewhere. So how do you standardize that? How do you mandate that, but also keep the flexibility necessary to keep ahead of the bad guys who are very, very sophisticated? Uh, but that's why, in, in my view, before we get to that too, I mentioned briefly in my opening comments that uh, I'm looking at ways that we have greater collaboration between government agencies that are investing a lot in this from the FBI to the, the Department of Defense to, uh, to uh, NSA and others uh, working with industry to collaborate as to how we bring all of our best minds together to, to work is kind of a more of a seamless way than we do right now. Now we have all these silos that folks aren't even talking to each other, which makes no sense uh, given that it's affecting all of us. So I think that's going to be our got to be our main focus in the short run is getting everybody talking on the same page and then figuring out how those solutions will develop from there.